Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you to the Faculty of Mechanical uh, Engineering and the Brno University for the invitation to give this talk. I'm really very honored. Uh, before I start, I'd like to acknowledge uh, two of my uh, key collaborators without whom the work could not have been made possible, uh, Professor Drittmiddle and Dr. Hugh Morgan. So, uh, the, uh, of course, one can uh, talk about coronal research uh, using any kind of observations. Uh, but what I, uh, my talk will focus mostly on uh, total solar eclipse observations because they are unique in uh, the kind of physics that we can infer from them. And I hope uh, by the end of the talk I would have uh, relayed uh, uh, this, uh, this message to you and to show you how, how important they are despite the fact that they're rare, they last a very, you know, a few minutes at best and so on. So this is, in, uh, to start, the background image was taken during a total solar eclipse, I, I think in um, uh, 2006 or 2008, anyway. Uh, but uh, the, the point is, if you take an image with a camera, so this is the moon blocking the surface of the sun, and this is what you can capture with, the, uh, with your um, camera. But that's not what your eye sees, and the eye sees far more details. And with image processing, for example, you can see details as exquisite as the ones shown above. So this is just a, a, um, a detail of, uh, of the, this area of the corona that was just underneath it. And this processing is, uh, was developed by Professor Drupinder. So the, uh, the outline of my talk, so what I'd like to do is give you, just for those of you I don't expect you to know much about the solar corona, just a very brief introduction as to what it means for the sun and also for other stars. And then I'll talk about, uh, very briefly about image processing techniques, just giving you examples because uh, I think you've heard the, the, all the technical aspects of it already. And then I give you uh, some, an overview of some of the discoveries that were made precisely using these techniques that uh, what you can uh, extract from the observations, of course all the information is there in the, in the image, but sometimes you don't notice it if your eye doesn't see it in an image. And it was by noticing these things that then we went back to the data and then were able to extract more information. So uh, I'll just give you a brief, uh, very, very brief uh, um, overview of, uh, of the corona. So, uh, the, it's really the fortuitous uh, distance uh, scale and size scale between uh, the Sun, the Earth and the Moon that total solar eclipses, natural total solar eclipses can happen. And without them, probably it might have taken us much longer to discover that the Sun had an outer atmosphere that we call the solar corona or the crown of the Sun. So, with the advent of spectroscopy, uh, avid eclipse observer uh, started to uh, use, uh, you know, t to point their uh, spectrograph at, at the sun or the corona, sorry, during a total solar eclipse. And the first discovery was, uh, this is a, a spectrum that uh, Milos had taken in uh, 2010, I think. Um, uh, so the, the first one was to discover that there was actually hydrogen in the corona. And this is a comparison with the uh, measurements in, in a, of a hydrogen uh, vacuum tube. The other discovery that was made in, during the same eclipse was uh, there was a line here that showed up, a very bright line, uh, you can see it of course here, and this one was not known yet. They, couldn't, uh, they didn't know the equivalent chemical um, uh, element that corresponded to this wavelength. And it was until 1895, so this is 1868, so we're talking about almost 30 years later, that Ramsey was able to identify it in the lab. And the name uh, Helium was given to it because from the god Helios that, re uh, that represents the sun. Uh, then uh, there was another line that, uh, that a, a year later, uh, two people independently observed the corona and they found this, uh, this very, very bright, uh, what we call green line. And at the time, again, they had no uh, comparison from, from the lab. So they called it coronium, basically, from the corona. And here, if you look at the date, so this was in 1869, and it wasn't until 1941 that this spectral line was identified as iron, which was stripped of 13 of its electrons. And for this to happen, you have to have a medium that's uh, over a million degrees in temperature. 
So that was really the beginning of, uh, so the, the research of, about the sun and the corona started to uh, almost uh, grow exponentially since this date. Because once it was established that the sun, uh, the corona, the outer atmosphere of the sun was very hot, then it had all kinds of implications. And the first implication was the fact that, uh, there could, uh, that the atmosphere is not bound to the sun, but it's actually expanding, and it's expanding all the way to interplanetary space. And uh, Gene Parker, who developed the theory, uh, called it the solar wind. So basically, it's, a, it's an escape of mostly uh, ionized uh, particles. Uh, it's 95% or more of electrons and protons. You have uh, some trace uh, um, alpha particles. And then you have all the trace elements that you find on, on Earth, iron, carbon, oxygen, whatever. So all this gas is, is propagating outwards and it's actually shaping the environment of all the planets along the way. Now, when Parker developed his theory, it was at the beginning of the space uh, exploration. And in 1962, this is uh, also a historic uh, data set, Snyder and Nogobar, what they did, they had a very simple uh, like a particle detector on board uh, a spacecraft called Mariner 2. And what they detected is they detected a continuous flow of particles. And what they measured is, uh, so um, you see two curves. One is a slightly thicker uh, black curve than the other. So the thicker one is the speed of the particles, and the thinner one is the, their density. So in, uh, in Parker's theory, he, he, uh, he, he did a very simple parameter study, and he said, well, if the temperature at the sun, where the wind in the corona, where the, this escape of particles is starting for, is half a million degrees, then this flow of, of, uh, uh, of particles as a function of distance, and this is the orbit of Earth, uh, should reach about 200 kilometers per second. If the temperature is much higher, let's say 4 million degrees, then you can reach speeds of over a thousand kilometers per second. So this was the simple theoretical development that led to just these, uh, a range of values. And what they discovered in space was uh, quite remarkable if you compare them to this uh, relatively simple theory because what he assumed is that the temperature of this wind was more or less constant. Uh, and uh, so this is uh, the, the measurements as a function of time. They had several months of measurements. There was a gap here. Uh, I'm not sure what exactly happened. But uh, what they found is if you look at the range of speeds, you see it ranges from 300 to about 800 kilometers per second. So it's, it's within the range of what was predicted by theory. And the other thing that they found was that the density of the particles were anti-correlated with the speed of the wind. So the faster the wind, uh, the, the more tenuous the plasma was. Uh, so this, is, uh, this has become more or less uh, um, like a given now for what we know about the solar wind. Now, of course, here they didn't measure any uh, uh, trace elements, but then subsequent uh, uh, trace heavy elements. But subsequent spacecraft actually measured uh, the composition of, of elements like, as I said, iron, helium, hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, etc. So without the hot corona, you, one would not have uh, discovered, you know, come to the conclusion that you had an outflow of, of these particles. And now we know that it's not just the sun, but also stars have uh, outflows, and some, some stellar winds are really massive, and they just they blow at speeds far exceeding 1,000 kilometers per second. So, uh, the next question was, well, okay, well, we know that there, there are these streams of, of uh, ionized particles uh, leaving the sun, and, uh, and the question is, well, where do they come from? We know the surface of the sun, uh, the visible surface, is at 6,000 degrees, and all of a sudden the temperature rises to over a million degrees in a very, very sh a small uh, distance range. Uh, so, uh, one exploration was to look at, uh, total sol uh, to look at the corona <coughs> during total solar eclipses. And uh, so what I would like to focus on is what we have learned from uh, just applying uh, different image processing tools. So in the next uh, slide, uh, so this example is from 2006. And uh, so the first uh, uh, technique uh, that uh, Miroslav uh, developed was in two papers in 2006 and 2009. And the idea is that 
to if with one this example here in the background is one uh, few seconds maybe four second exposure times in white light and you can see that you saturate the inner corona and then you see some streams going up now with the saturated part it's impossible to do anything because uh, the, you, you, your counts are just at the, at the highest level so what you do is you take a sequence of exposure times and then you try to combine them together to get a, 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 some picture that makes a, some sense. So uh, what Miloš did is he actually developed a technique for the combination, for combining images with, uh, with different exposure times, you know, aligning them. It's a very sophisticated and, and complicated technique. And you, you reproduce with these, this technique the very high dynamic range of the corona. So uh, the intensity of the emission that you're seeing uh, can drop by uh, six or seven orders of magnitude over a few solar radii. So you can imagine that there is no uh, one camera that can capture this drop, and you really have to go through this process. So uh, this is uh, the exact eclipse, and this is what you get uh, from uh, applying this technique. So you see right away that there are incredible details uh, around the sun, and uh, these are the, some of the features that we will be discussing. The next technique was developed by uh, Hugh Morgan, who at the time was uh, working with me as a postdoc. And uh, so this is, uh, now I should mention that after the, uh, the discovery of, uh, of the corona and so on, uh, people who were uh, avid eclipse observers, uh, obviously it's kind of frustrating when you uh, take a whole year to prepare to go to an eclipse and all of a sudden you have a cloud and everything is lost. So uh, Bernalio in 1932 came up with a design of a what he called a coronagraph. So it's basically a man-made occulter, so in your optics you try to block the sun and then you uh, try to expose the corona. Now of course then you can observe the corona every day, uh, you know, all hours when the sun is up. But there are significant limitations. One of them is the fact that you, uh, due to diffraction, you, have, uh, you cannot look very close to, to the sun uh, because of the diffraction pattern around the occulter. And second, uh, because it's a small object, uh, it doesn't dim the sky like in a total solar eclipse. So during a total solar eclipse, the sky is dimmed almost to nighttime, uh, you know, uh, brightness. And this is why you can see the corona so far out. So you, you limit it both in the inner part and the outer extent of the corona with the coronagraphs. Nevertheless, there are a number of them that have been built and they have been very successful because you can get a time sequence even if you don't get uh, very close to the sun. Uh, so one of the uh, very successful missions was uh, the Soho spacecraft that was launched in 1995. And uh, they had a suite of uh, instruments on board and the, the spacecraft is still functioning. One of them is what we call the white light coronagraph. So in this one, uh, this is the, the diameter of the sun here. And this is their occulter. So it's blocking uh, one radius above the surface. And with these uh, observations, it wasn't just from, uh, I mean, there were predecessors to, to uh, this uh, SOHO. Uh, what people discovered, these, uh, these bubbles of gas that really expanded through the corona, and uh, they were connected with significant magnetic disturbances on Earth. So uh, with our dependence on GPS and uh, all kinds of uh, uh, communication, uh, these can really be extremely hazardous. Now the technique that uh, Hugh uh, developed was basically to remove uh, the radial uh, drop of distance of the intensity and what you get uh, by, so this is the original image and this is what you get by applying this technique. So you, you start to see all the structures in the corona and unlike the previous example where you saw all the details in the inner corona, here you see the outer corona and the very very fine, fine filamentary structures and you also see here while the coronal mass ejection was uh, saturated, here you start to see all the details, the intricate details of the twisted magnetic field lines inside these features. Now another, uh, this is just a, 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 a movie taken from these uh, long, uh, because it's in space then you don't have the atmospheric interferences and then you have uh, 24 hours coverage of the sun. 
So with these observations, uh, in this case, there are actually two coronagraphs. The first one I showed you previously stops here. And then the other one that was denied, <coughs> designed uh, starts here and goes further out. And the reason for needing two is, as I mentioned, the, uh, the decrease in intensity is enormous as you go from the sun outwards. And you cannot capture uh, more than you know, 60,000 degrees uh, levels of uh, intensity levels with just one coronagraph, you need more. So this is uh, the design of the Lasco coronagraph. And here what you see is the sun is continuously spewing material. Some of them is in more uh, jet light and uh, light, and others are these huge bubbles. Now again, this image was processed. Now another uh, very important uh, uh, wavelength to explore the sun is in the extreme ultraviolet. And the uh, significant advantage is that here, because the, the, the photosphere doesn't emit in the ultraviolet, you, have, uh, you can see the surface of the sun, and you can see a little bit past uh, the, the edge of the sun. So with one instrument, you can see both the surface and you can see uh, the extension. However, the, uh, the drawback or limitations of this, uh, of this wavelength range is that you cannot see uh, further away uh, more than about a quarter of a radius. And the reason being is because these, uh, the emission from these <coughs> ultraviolet lines is produced by collisional excitation, and it goes as the density square, so it drops very, very quickly with distance. So these techniques were developed uh, by uh, the NAP and the MGN to actually process these types of images. So this uh, first one is again, uh, Miloš developed it. So this is the original image, and this is uh, the instrument is called the Solar Dynamic Observatory, or SDO for short. And this is the image that uh, he processed, and you can see that the, the fine details in, you know, extending above the lens, as well as on uh, the surface of the sun. So all these, with these kind of details, you start to see features you hadn't seen before, and you start to try to find explanations for, for these features. And then finally, uh, you and Milos uh, got together and they developed another technique, which was, uh, did, uh, was very important for looking at both the details on the surface as well as the extended emission. But again, this is, uh, this is mostly it's, uh, uh, optimized for the extreme ultraviolet. So now I will move on to uh, what uh, this is. Oh, uh, this is just a composite of using two techniques. So the outer one is from the total solar eclipse of 2010, and the inner uh, one is from STO. And STO was observing at the same time as the eclipse. So uh, these two images uh, were uh, combined together, and you can see you can't even tell the con uh, where one starts and the other picks up because the uh, the uh, processing was so precise and the images, both of them, have such uh, uh, fine details that these finest details are actually matching up extremely well. So uh, you might not be able to even guess where this one stops and where the uh, total solar eclipse observations uh, stop. So, uh, so now I will move on, uh, so the, just to summarize quickly, for, uh, what were what did imaging, image processing do for uh, the uh, observations is they revealed coronal structures that we were not aware of their presence and they also expand uh, the visual extent of the of the emission so now with this information then we go back and say well okay what can we gain as far as knowledge of, of the solar corona so this is what I, I would like to uh, explore next uh, I'd like to first go through a series of uh, eclipse observations taken uh, in, uh, in at different times and to show you that one, how different the corona looks like and you probably know that uh, there are sunspots on the solar surface and uh, they change in, uh, in number uh, in, over time and they form what we call the solar cycle. So it's about a 10 year uh, cycle of going from a minimum number of almost no sunspots to a maximum number of many sunspots. And in, in connection with the sunspot activity, the shape of the corona in, in the sense of all these fine structures that you see in the corona vary a lot over uh, the same uh, time frame. 
Now, whether all these are directly connected to sunspot or not, it's not clear, but it's clear that the sun, uh, whatever uh, cyclical behavior of the magnetism on the sun is reflected uh, in, in the corona. And all these features you're seeing are actually the magnetic field lines of the sun that are escaping from the solar surface. And the brightness that's coming to us in the white light is from the electrons that, because they're ionized, they, they uh, spiral along magnetic field lines. And they basically serve as tracers of the magnetic fields. So we don't really have a way to measure the magnetic field uh, intensity in the corona. It's a very difficult measurement. Uh, and so, but what we do is we use uh, this white light information, or information I'll show you later from other spectral lines, to, to get an idea of what the magnetic field combined with the plasma flow, how they together, how they form these kind of structures. Uh, so this is, uh, this is uh, one of them, and then this is in, uh, from 2010, uh, uh, in July. Uh, so during this eclipse, uh, the, the naked eye could actually see this very strange looking feature and also this very sharp edge here and also this, this this kind of stream. And uh, so, if, of course, if we had, if I had just shown you the image, the, the raw image, you wouldn't have seen much, but uh, with this processing, you can see the incredible details. So the, you can see this uh, feature, which we call the hook, and you all around it here, you can see that there were, uh, the magnetic field lines were almost like a helical structure, twisted and unfurling as they, as they expanded into uh, space. And this one, we weren't sure what this was, until we actually combined it with observations from LASCO, the, the chronograph I told you. So the outer one is uh, from the spacecraft, and here uh, the image has been processed slightly differently to just uh, take, uh, uh, to show uh, things that are changing very, very dramatically. So the inset is from the eclipse, and the outer one is from LASCO. And you can see here Again, another advantage of the eclipse observations in the sense that uh, all this information from these observations fills the gap that is there from the last four observations. So this is an in, 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 in animation or an actual movie. So what I'd like you to, uh, you can look at whatever you want, but you, there are two, uh, this is the first place which I would like you to focus on. You see these sharp edges here, and if you look at what was going through the corona, so again there was a coronal mass ejection that went through the corona prior to the eclipse, and it basically produced this wedge. It's almost like a tornado going through a forest and just uh, cutting all the trees around them, which is very surprising because this is a plasma, it's very tenuous, but yet look at all the, the, the this edge of this coronal mass ejection which matches exactly these very sharp edges that we captured in the eclipse image. And then here you also see that this twisting here of, uh, of uh, these structures actually is, is also captured uh, or is, uh, proceeds as you go further out in, uh, in, from the sun. Now this is a, another example from 2012 and here we're getting closer to uh, the time when the, the number of sunspots on the sun is very high. So you can see that the shape, what we call the shape of the corona is very different. You see these large streams everywhere around the sun and you see some, uh, an increasing number of these bubble uh, shaped features. And this was another very interesting feature that was captured here, basically almost the beginning of a CME detaching from the sun or a coronal mass ejection. And then in 2013, uh, uh, this was uh, from uh, different uh, people uh, who observed uh, the eclipse. And uh, the, you can see this is probably one of the very few or first eclipse observations where uh, you capture this kind of uh, plasma, uh, plasmoid escaping from the sun. And these are uh, also like uh, they are of uh, the same nature or, or the type of events that produce these coronal mass ejections. But here you can see that the, uh, the, the fine details in this eclipse image are really astounding. So now I'd like to move on to uh, more of the physics of the corona and, uh, and what we are ab were able to infer from looking at not just the white light, 
but also the, the in wavelengths that are uh, specific to the, the coronium that I mentioned earlier. And it just so happens that there are, that there are a number of spectral lines in what we call uh, the visible part of the spectrum that can be used to uh, single out this line and look at the corona in this uh, emission. And these are called coronal forbidden lines, uh, for a reason I'll explain in a little bit. So this is uh, just a, a spectrum of the sun, of the corona, sorry. So you see the background radiation from the photosphere, it's just a black body radiation. And then you see these uh, emission lines superimposed over this background. So to, uh, to extract the emission only, let's say, from hydrogen alpha, you need to subtract this, this, this whole background. And then you see that there are iron lines, uh, iron 10 now. Uh, it just so happens that the atomic physicist and the, and the uh, physicists, they have a different way of writing these. Uh, so for example, you can, uh, iron, uh, Roman numeral 10 would be iron stripped of 9 electrons. Uh, so these are the, this is the coronium line and this is another one that was discovered during eclipses. And then you have one that's just at the edge of the visible, it's an iron 11 line. And uh, nobody had uh, actually observed it or imaged in it till we did it and uh, we were successful in 2006. Okay, so what's so special about these lines? Well, usually, a, 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 for example, in the... Uh, extreme ultraviolet, this is their typical wavelength of the lines from, let's say, 100 to 300 angstroms or 30 nanometers, uh, the lifetime of the excited state is like 10 to the minus 12 seconds. But if you go to these, uh, what we call the coronal forbidden lines, then they have a, a, a lifetime that's uh, much, much longer. I mean, you're talking about a fraction of a second compared to 10 to the minus 12. And this is, it turns out to be really ideal in, uh, or uh, critical for be, uh, being able to observe the sun. So in addition to uh, uh, the, uh, uh, their very uh, long uh, uh, lifetime, uh, each one of these lines has a very well-defined uh, peak ionization temperature. So for example, if the gas is predominantly at half a million degrees, you will see emission in uh, this iron nine line, but you won't see much in the others. And if you are at the other extreme where the gas is at a temperature of two and a half million degrees, you will see probably this nickel 15, and you won't see any of the other lines. So this presents us with a, an incredible diagnostic of being able to measure the temperature of the corona, obviously without being there with a thermometer, just by looking at the spectrum. And this is, uh, so the first time we were able to image in, uh, in so many uh, spectral lines at the same time was in 2010. And uh, so you see, uh, first of all, the, ray, uh, the different images we, uh, we took. And uh, also I put the temperature of formation of each one of these spectral lines. So the temperature increases in this direction. But the most important thing is how different the corona looks like in each one of these spectral lines. So for iron 9, you know, it's very faint and you see very, very little uh, emission extending uh, away from the sun. You go to this iron 10, you start to see lots of detail. And this iron 11 line that I told you was difficult to image gives the most, uh, uh, most details about the corona. And then you go to hotter lines, iron 13, and this is the coronium line, and this is uh, nickel 15. So you can combine these images together to produce a, 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 like a color composite uh, like this one. So here uh, the green is uh, the iron 14 line and the red is the iron 11 line. So we, we have seen the images in white light and now, now what we're able to do is assign a temperature to these structures that we're seeing. And what's the most uh, surprising here, or was to us, is to see that everything that uh, goes out is expanding, like uh, you know, almost escaping from the sun, not to return, is, has this uh, reddish hue, which is uh, the cooler temperature of a million degrees. Whereas everything else that seems to be in the form of arches, where the magnetic field lines start from the sun and come back, they're mostly the, the plasma or the material is confined to the sun, it's at this much higher temperature. 
So here we have, uh, we, we were able to produce the first temperature map of, of the corona. And here I will talk about it a little later. You see there is a, a, some kind of uh, boundary between this hot material and this cooler material. Okay. Now for those of you, of course you're most uh, all mathematicians and this would probably shock you and alarm you, but I, this is what we call back of the envelope calculation. I just want to prove a point that actually turned out to be uh, uh, you know, really valid. So um, the intensity of emission from any uh, spectral line uh, is, is formed by two, um, two components, a collisional excitation and a resonant excitation. And I'm just going to, it's only this one slide, and the reason I'm going through it is because it's very important to then understand what we were able to get out of these measurements. So the first term uh, depends is a product of the electron and ion density, and since you're looking at the sun, you are integrating along your line of sight, so obviously it's a very long line of sight, but it's uh, most heavily weighted towards the plane of the sky, which is uh, the, the shortest distance to the sun. Now, the forbidden lines are uh, dominated by this emission. They have a small uh, collisional component. Now, you can see right away uh, if, uh, that um, because of the dependence on density in these two terms, this term, term, which goes as the density squared, is going to drop off much faster with, with distance than this one. Uh, so we wanted to test this idea. So what we did is we took, uh, this is the, the formula I gave you, and this is the white light, all the images that I showed you. The white light is just uh, an integral of the electron density. So it's the same kind of dependence on density as the resonant component. So we decided, well, let's take the ratio of the two, because in an eclipse we measure both. Uh, we take the spectral line and we do the white light. And if you take the ratio, then the first term is just proportional to the ion density, and the second term is proportional to the density of the ions to the electrons. Now, if uh, so, uh, we know that the, the density of the gas drops with, with radial distance quite rapidly, so if this term is dominant, then you take the ratio in the data, then you should see something that falls off very quickly. If this is the dominant term, and if the ions and the electrons uh, fall off with distance in the same manner, then this is just going to be a flat curve. So we took the uh, observations uh, in 2006 from the island line, and what we did, this is just one section of, of the image, and we took different traces, uh, color-coded here, and uh, in the first plot here we see the, the intensity of what you measure in the continuum or white light, and the other one is the intensity of the line itself the spectral line, let's say iron 11 in this case. And this bottom curve shows you the ratio of the two. So sure enough, the ratio shows a very sharp drop with distance close to the sun, and then it kind of uh, sh uh, gets shallower, and then it flattens. So this is the first time we were able to determine where in the corona you go from a region where uh, the collisions are more important in forming a spectral line, to where they stop being important, and then you basically, what happens is uh, the ion, uh, when you have the collisions, the ion, the ionization state of an ion can change. But once you go beyond this region, then it's fixed, it, can, it doesn't have any electrons to collide with, and it's not going to get excited to another level. And from measurements in interplanetary space, people have measured the composition of the sun and the ionization state of the different uh, elements. So, but they always tried to guess where in the corona this, uh, this step happened. And this was the first time that we were able to measure it. Okay, so what we find is, depending on the structures, you have a distance of about between 1.1 and 2 solar radii. And this is just a way of, of uh, uh, just plotting this curve here. So the background image is the image of the corona in, uh, from 2008, and this is uh, the distance range where you have this transformation from uh, inside here you have uh, the, the collisions are dominant and beyond that anything that's escaping has, can no longer change its identity and what you observe in interplanetary space is really coming then from this region. Okay, um, this is just uh, more temperature uh, uh, maps of the corona just to show you that 
from observations in 2008, 9, and 10. Uh, well, the shape of the corona changes, I mentioned it before, but you also see uh, the distribution of the temperature. And again, anything that's escaping from the sun is at this uh, cooler temperature of, uh, of uh, a million degrees. And anything that's uh, connected to the sun is at two million degrees. So now I, I mentioned that uh, people have taken uh, these measurements in interplanetary space. And so the question is, well, do our measurements in the corona, uh, are they consistent with the measurements in interplanetary space? So this is, uh, I'll explain this, this uh, plot. So this is, uh, imagine you have your spacecraft uh, or a detector in somewhere uh, between the Earth and the Sun. And it's collecting information about, in this case, it's iron. And they're able to, connect, uh, to get the information from different charge states of iron. So the lowest is uh, iron that was stripped of seven electrons. And here it goes up to iron that's uh, stripped of 16. And uh, on this curve, so this is, um, you don't really need to know. Uh, this, this kind of, uh, this axis is more or less connected to this information. But what's important here is the speed of these particles and also uh, where the distribution is the highest. And you can see that the largest distribution over, uh, this is uh, I think a one month of data, that it all is clustered around uh, these low uh, charge states. So in some ways this is, uh, now it, it kind of explains why we see most of the emission that's extended or expanding away from the sun is at a million degrees because these charge states are actually typical of a million degree plasma. And this was another uh, exercise we went through. We took all these, uh, the information from a whole solar cycle of these charge states measured in interplanetary space. So here you have the different charge states of iron, iron 6, 8, 10, etc. And this is a histogram of these uh, data. And you can see that there's a peak in the distribution around the charge state of, of basically 9. And our iron 11 line is actually this iron uh, 10. So we take this information and we fold it into what we know about our spectral line, the, the ionization temperature. <coughs> what we found is we found a very, very sharp peak at uh, 1.18 million degrees, which is exactly the peak formation temperature of iron 11. So this gave us an explanation of why you see so many details in the iron 11 image. And basically, we now we know where these ions are forming and where they basically uh, uh, maintain <coughs> their identity when they escape into interplanetary space. Now, uh, I uh, just to mention that this is again over uh, uh, 10, uh, uh, 10 years of data. And then here, the shape of the corona had changed significantly over this time period. And you can see here the number of sunspots over this time period. So each one of these dots corresponds to one of these eclipse images. So despite the fact that the corona had changed so much that you come out with a, a, a temperature that's almost constant. So it's almost like there is some uh, physical process that's controlling the temperature. It's like, a, you know, you have a, a thermostat or something that's telling the, the expanding corona you cannot exceed a million degrees when you escape from the sun. Now we still don't know what that is but this was one uh, uh, finding. Another uh, discovery came also with the imaging of the iron 11 line and when it was processed with the NRGF what we found is uh, there were regions where uh, this is not a, a saturation in the image it just shows you that locally the emission from iron 11 was much higher than uh, the surroundings. So it's, it's a local enhancement, so to speak, of the intensity of the emission. So this is just showing you the different uh, regions. And what we did then is we compared it with uh, the white light uh, emission uh, of, uh, during the same total solar eclipse. And I just put a few circles, color-coded, to show you where we found the, uh, the enhancement in iron 11. But if you look here, there was actually a depletion in the, uh, in the white light. And the same for this region and also here. So this was very curious because you say, well, uh, the white light is formed by all the electrons that are escaping from the sun. How come we see a depletion here when in iron 11 we see an enhancement? 
So we went through the same, uh, this is a visu visualization of this enhancement. So we went through the same exercise I explained earlier. So we took the ratio of the continuum and the lines. And sure enough, what we found is that locally here, uh, the ion density, the ratio of the ion to the electron density showed a, a, a peak at this distance. So what it meant is that the ions were no longer falling off with uh, radial distance as quickly as the electrons. So something was holding them back. And uh, so uh, then it just so happened that in, uh, at the same time, uh, a, another group that was doing theoretical modeling of the solar wind, they found that uh, they were trying to see how the heavy ions coupled to the background the electrons and protons. And what they found is that if you don't give enough energy to, to the heavy ions, then they don't couple to the solar wind flow anymore, and they just lag behind. And what they find in their, in their, so these are our observations and they were able to model them. So they find a localized peak. So now we know that this localized enhancement is due to the fact that something is not heating the elements in some magnetic structure, not as well as the rest of the corona. So these are producing open questions which we don't have answers to, but nevertheless they were uh, new discoveries. So I uh, will uh, then move on to some interesting features that look uh, very, um, uh, I mean, uh, they, they stand out in any eclipse uh, because of their pinkish hue, and they're called prominences. So people had seen them for, for uh, any, any, most of the eclipse chasers, they go just to see these flames uh, coming out of the sun, as they call them. Now, in this uh, white light image, uh, the exposure time is short enough that you only see the prominences, but you don't see the rest of the corona. But if you extend your uh, exposure time, then you will see both. You will see the prominences and you will see the, uh, the white light. So, going back to this image, I talked about the temperature structure, but now I can go back and talk about uh, the environment of these prominences. So you can see this is the one I showed you just a minute ago. And uh, if we look at the spectral lines, then what we see is this prominence, which is uh, made of uh, mostly hydrogen emission. So it's very cool gas. It's cool and dense. And it's at a temperature of 10,000 degrees. And we know that the corona is at a million degrees. So what's happening? Here you have something like a finger sticking out in a very hot medium and just sitting there. So how could it be? And the other thing is, why is the environment uh, so hot? Why isn't it at the million degrees? Why isn't it less? But it's really uh, made of these arch-like structures, and it's the hottest material in the ground. And here, in this case, there is one bit of prominence that kind of uh, left the surface. It probably, it might have been still uh, connected. And it, it kind of delineates a boundary between the hot material here and cooler material that's escaping from the sun. And these are, uh, so the other uh, very interesting features that came out of uh, the uh, image processing was the fact uh, to look at the intricate details of the overlying magnetic field lines over these prominences. Now this was, uh, these two observations were taken uh, during the same eclipse but from two sites that were separated in eclipse time by uh, 19 minutes. And you can see how these structures actually changed over this time period. It had nothing to do with the rotation of the sun, but they are very dynamic structures, and you can see the changes uh, in, in, in them. So these are two different sections from the corona. Now when we, um, it was all uh, thanks to Minos' processing, that some very, very faint structures also were, were, came out in the image processing. And uh, so the, some of them, are, we've already talked about these twisted helical structures. We saw them here, we saw the hook. But then there are, uh, I don't know if you can, how well you can see these like uh, faint bubbles expanding from the sun. And you can see them here. And then there are those funny shaped features which uh, are very uh, similar to what people call vortex rings or smoke rings. So all these structures uh, started to come out in these images, in addition to what we call the larger scale structure of the expanding streamers. And uh, so in a, we, 
we looked at several uh, eclipse observations and they are always there. You know, in every eclipse observation you see these expanding bubbles, you see uh, more intricate ones here. It's almost like you have turbulence in the medium. And so from these observations we were able to uh, relate these features to actually the prominences. So the intricate uh, environment of prominence, prominences and because they're, hot, uh, they're dense and cool gas in a hot environment, uh, they actually are subject to uh, many plasma instabilities. And here we're able to, in these eclipse observations, actually capture the uh, evolution of these instabilities as they escape from the sun and, and go into interplanetary space. And this has never been uh, seen before. I mean, inst uh, plasma instabilities and turbulence has been observed in interplanetary space in the solar wind, but never imaged in, in the program. Okay, uh, so these are uh, other, uh, again, you can see these uh, what we call smoke rings or, or uh, uh, screw-like shaped structures. And this is, uh, again, going back to, I, th I mentioned it already, this prominence that was delineating two, uh, uh, two regions. So, uh, as I told you, the prominences, when they're fixed to the sun, they have uh, the hottest material around them. And now this prominence uh, kind of lifted off, and it lifted off with the material that was ahead of it. And this material started to cool, and that's why we're seeing it in the iron, uh, in iron 11 or at a million degrees. Uh, so uh, this is, I've already mentioned this one, so uh, I'd like to conclude by saying that it was really uh, thanks to image processing that we discovered many things about the corona that we wouldn't have been uh, aware of their presence. I mean, all the information is there in the image. We're not doing anything except you're uh, extracting them. And as I showed you when we took the, uh, the actual measurements, uh, we, you go to the raw data, you see something in the, in the processed image, and you go to your data, you take intensity curves, you do whatever you want, and lo and behold, you start to find the reasons why you're seeing some of the features like this. So uh, this is just a summary of the intricate details and how prominences actually are playing a very important role in producing plasma instabilities. And nobody had ever thought about uh, the fact that the turbulence we see in the solar wind is actually goes back to these little big things that are sticking out of the sun. And then, uh, as I said, we also have uh, found uh, that heavy ions have this property where if they're, they don't get enough heat, then they just uh, they start to escape from the sun and then they can't make it anymore because they don't have enough energy. And we were also able to map the electron temperature of the corona and uh, to determine where uh, the distance at which uh, these charge states that we measure in interplanetary space basically get de determined in, in the inner corona. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. So any question? Maybe I will ask yeah. which techniques for the image processing do you use? Uh, we, use uh, uh, we use all the, the, the two techniques. Uh, for example, this one was with the technique that uh, Professor Duke Miller developed. And uh, the one where we discovered the Island 11 emission, we actually used the NRGF which uh, it, it takes out, it gets rid of the very sharp drop with radial distance. But uh, with the NRGF, you're not able to uh, rep uh, recover all these uh, loop line structures. But it really brought out uh, the localized enhancements. Um, just a small question. I hope it's about the future. What, what, uh, what are the new tasks using this, this, uh, this uh, tools you, you developed? Uh, do, you, do you have some, some goals you would like to... to with more eclipse observations? Yes. 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 So uh, our goal now next is uh, we have uh, limited our investigations to the iron lines because they are the strongest lines. So our hope is to be able to observe in, for example, there are uh, strong lines in nickel, in sulfur, argon, and so on. So if we... Uh, can financially manage to get money to observe in these because the filters are rather expensive. If we can do that, then uh, in, in uh, trying to explore the composition of the solar wind and the corona, 
if you have more elements, then you can say, uh, because each one of these elements has different properties, physical properties. So if we observe something in nitrogen we don't observe in, in iron, then it can tell us something also about uh, the composition, not only of, of the corona, but also of, of the sun itself. So this is our goal, to expand into uh, other, uh, other uh, elements, yes. if we can. In what, in what form do you have the, 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 uh, the input data? <coughs> I mean, uh, do you have the input data as images? The input data for your, for your process, do you have it in, uh, as images or this is a file of numbers and Dr. Duke Miller is creating the, uh, the images? Well, uh, what you get out of any camera are an image, but the image corresponds to numbers on your detector. Yeah. So, so you, you so have images? We have images, but the image is just the display, yeah, and, the, and we have the actual numbers. So what do you mean by huh? multi lambda observations? Multi wavelength. I use lambda because in physics you use lambda for oh, wavelength. That's what I mean. Yes. <laughs> multi wavelength. Yeah. yeah, out of curiosity, I'm asking. Um, you had the uh, you know observation in India also. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, have you, um, you know, <coughs> uh, did observation in other countries? Yes, each eclipse happens in a different place. Like in 2010, it was on a small atoll in French Polynesia, so literally a few hundred kilometers in length. Uh, this uh, past uh, November, we went to Kenya, northern part of Kenya. Then the year before, we went to Australia. Uh, the most challenging ones were really uh, going to, well, Kenya was very, very challenging, and uh, Tatakoto was challenging because it's not like we travel with one camera and they travel. That would be, you can go anywhere on a small boat, but in our case, our equipment is, uh, although the camera is about this size with uh, the detector, the optics, and the filter, but when you have 12 of them, it makes uh, you know, a, a large volume and you have to carry the mounts, the tripods, <coughs> you have to have electricity uh, to run everything. You need uh, laptops to run the cameras. Uh, so uh, we become limited in when we find a site, we have to stay put. And unfortunately, sometimes it, it works against you because if you see a cloud, you can't move anymore. But if you have your camera and your tripod, you can try to go a little bit further away. So. Um, the eclipses happen all over the, the world, and I didn't show a map of where they happen. Uh, but the next, uh, for example, next year it will go over uh, at the North Sea. It goes close to I Iceland over the Faroe Islands and then Svalbard, which is north of Norway. In 2016 it goes over Indonesia, islands of it has small islands. And 2017 is actually a fantastic opportunity for anybody who wants to do eclipse observations because the path of totality goes across the United States, from the northwest to the southeast. So you have a huge uh, land mass, and you can basically drive with whatever you can take. A U-Haul, a truck, or something, put your equipment, and <coughs> drive to find a good spot. And what we're planning to do is find several, locate, uh, you know, establish several sites along the path of totality, and that's feasible because it's all connected. Uh, because as I showed you, you can see the dynamic changes of the corona over a few minutes. So if we, and that uh, whole, um, the event will take an hour and a half from the beginning to the end. So if you have six stations, you, you cover things over this time. Hello, Shkandekor. Do you have a question before the call to the first question about the initial processing technique that will be the last contribution of this conference? So today, well, the explanation about your technique, for example, this image, 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 Is it possible to use the moon as a coronal graph uh, for the, from the spaceship? Yes, uh, we have uh, proposed that. It's, uh, I mean, uh, it's, it's feasible, but um, one of the drawbacks is uh, well, the, the trajectory and the orbits of the spacecraft can be calculated very precisely, so you can do that. Uh, the one uh, thing that people are not sure of is the dust that's spotted from the lunar surface, if it's going to impact the, the uh, observation. 
But in principle, yes, that would be the very, it's a very attractive uh, idea that we have proposed, but it might not happen in my lifetime. <laughs> So if there is no question, I congratulate, I thank our professor. Let me also thank Professor Hamar for presenting such a nice, nice lecture. I would like to give her some small, small souvenir to remind oh. her uh, <laughs> and participating in this conference. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you, thank you so much.